Welcome, everyone. And I'm so glad that we woke up this morning with an evening that was a little more calm than the previous uh, nights before us. We've been involved with a series that we've entitled, Don't Waste Your Sorrows. And little did we know how apropos the, that title would be for the backdrop of these times, a pandemic, um, that then as well, all of the events that have taken place this week, beginning with the killing of George Floyd. And uh, Pastor Zach Bush was uh, intended to close out this series, Don't Waste Your Sorrows. We'll bring that message to you in the near future. But we thought it would be wise just to pause, to give attention to the situation at hand, to listen and to learn in a conversation about race. And this is an opportunity for us to not waste our sorrows. We will not do that. In fact, we will seize this as an opportunity to gain wisdom and truth, love and compassion. And there's a lot of pain and sorrow to be had everywhere. We have sorrow for George Floyd and what he endured for those eight minutes and for his family as well. We have sorrow for the beautiful Twin Cities that has been attacked by agitators and troublemakers and evildoers who mostly have come from the outside to create chaos and confusion and to cause damage and destruction. And these are folks that have come in as detractors from wanting us to have the conversation that brings healing and hope to bring us together as a nation. And I feel the personal weight of that just because of my background in living in the neighborhood of the third precinct and joining a group of pastors there on Thursday evening to pray and to invite God's presence to be with us in the midst of all of this trouble. So I feel the pain of that neighborhood. I walk that neighborhood. I know it so very well. And so we don't want to waste these sorrows. These things are before us. We want to stand with God as we move into the future. What we like to do is really three things in the short amount of time that we have today. We want to gain understanding. We want to give hope. And we want to lament and pray together at the conclusion of our time. And to gain understanding, I've invited a couple of friends to join me in this conversation in order to uh, have better understanding of what's going on. Brian Fleming, who is a 10-year member at Westwood and uh, is part of our racial justice and reconciliation team. He is an educational consultant and works with school systems locally and nationally on bringing improvement projects into those different communities and school systems. And uh, Pastor Laurel Bunker, dear friend, who is the Associate Vice President of Faith Formation and Church Relations at Bethel University. She is no stranger to us. She just spoke here on Mother's Day, in fact, and considers Westwood part of her own church home. So we're delighted for their presence and and they'll be speaking in a short while. We will give hope in giving an opportunity to learn more about our racial justice and reconciliation team and what it's about and how we can step into that. And then we'll end with prayer and lament because the reality is we need God's help. That there is no race or ethnicities that are greater or more valuable than any other. And the good news is that Jesus Christ came with a power to break down those barriers between race and ethnicities. And we learn in God's word so many different perspectives from it, but the Apostle Paul speaks to it very poignantly in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Friends, we meet together at the foot of the same cross. And God's purpose was to erase forever these dividing walls that we have between us. We are saved the same way by faith. Uh, We are loved the same way by the sacrificial demonstration of Jesus on that cross. And we breathe the same breath. So, It is uh, my privilege to invite our friends to speak and help us to listen and to learn um, about their stories and what's taking place so that we can be the church in a stronger and better kind of way. 
And Brian, I'm going to start with you because the reality is this isn't a single isolated event. Part of what we're seeing is all the pent-up anger over wrongful deaths that seem to come again and again, not just George's. But I'd like to ask you and Laurel to respond as well to how you're navigating, how you're dealing with the death of George Floyd in your own personal journey and experience. Thank you, uh, Pastor Joel, and, and, and thank you, Laurel, and thank you, Westwood, for, number one, having the courage to uh, proactively and intentionally take a stand. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul is clearly an inflection point uh, for the rest of the country and for the rest of the world, actually. Uh, when I watched the video, uh, I was immediately struck with a deep sense of rage, um, dismay, despair. Uh, I, I had an intellectual understanding of uh, the, the, the cauldron of racial enmity that, that exists um, just below the surface in everyday life. Yeah. Uh, some of us have to carry that uh, with us uh, more so than others. That's been our history for uh, three, four hundred years now. Um, I was struck by uh, just the, the vile, uh, demonic nature of the murder uh, and immediately um, was taken to my knees um, in prayer and also uh, with a sense of hopelessness. That could have been um, me uh, in the wrong part of town at the, at, at the wrong opportunity, facing the wrong person or the person with the wrong sensibilities um, and so uh, it, it was very tragic the next uh, struggle that I've been dealing with all week is um, you know, I have a daughter who's navigating this world as a, 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 a biracial brilliant young woman and I want her to be able to uh, navigate this world with a sense of confidence and competence and a, and a positive uh, racial identity and I knew I would have to have this conversation with her I, I knew that I would have to somehow tell her the truth about the roots of oppression um, and, and uh, racism. Um, but the struggle is how do, how do we talk about this uh, with all of our children, with all of the people in our spheres of influence without shattering um, their hopefulness and without uh, letting, them, letting their faith, um, in this case my daughter Anna, uh, tell her the truth without letting her faith derail um, because she needs to have a sense of hope, hopefulness. Um, and so that, that's where I'm at today. I'm, 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 I'm glad that last night was calmer. I understand the rage that led to the looting and the, and the rioting. I think it's um, eerily ironic that the words that Dr. King spoke 53 years ago about the conditions that create looting and, and riots um, were so yeah. prescient. I mean, he foreshadowed something that happened yeah. on May 25th, 2020 in 1967. Yeah. Um, and so if, if America doesn't pause and think about <clears throat> what communities of color and what leaders, white, black, Hispanic, from all hues have been saying to us, um, we'll repeat this. We'll be, we'll be back here at this moment. Yeah, that's a good word. Can I ask how your daughter received the conversation? She received it quite well. Um, and I was so, you can see the smile on my face. Yeah. Uh, she, she gets it. Yeah. She gets it. She understands that navigating uh, her, her biculture, her biracial heritage um, comes with um, some pride, but it also comes with some complication. Yeah. And so she absolutely um, understands what happened, why it happens, and um, she's prepared to uh, make a difference and make a change. Yeah. I'm grateful, Brian, that you, in the last 48 hours, adapted your schedule, made time to be with us so we can listen and learn from your story and as well from yours, Laurel. Laurel is in St. Paul. So um, last night after the curfew was set, the freeways were closed off. 
uh, there was real concern about threat to property and even to lives. And so there was a question mark whether Laurel could make it today. And fortunately, the freeways opened up and you made it this morning for us to be together. So grateful that you're here. How would you respond to the same question? How are you personally dealing with um, George's death and his killing and its impact in your own life and with your family? Well, <clears throat> I've got to first say thank you because to be very honest with you, I had Joel come and get me because I wasn't comfortable leaving my house. Um, Black Hawk helicopters were swirling all evening. I live very close to the state capitol. Um, and I'm related, like a lot of us, I'm related to many people in the St. Paul Police Department and the Minneapolis Police Department. So I know policing. <laughs> I grew up with policing. Um, Mayor Melvin Carter, his father's a retired police officer. I've been raised around police officers all of my life, which is part of what makes this devastating. Because when you know good policing, you can spot bad policing. Yeah, good. And it's maddening to, because it makes it hard on the cops that are trying to do their jobs, on the black cops that have to navigate both race and power. All of those things, the Debbie Montgomery's that I was raised with, who was the first African-American female in the state of Minnesota to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. this, this is not an isolated incident. And so for all of you who want to turn this off or roll your eyes, you have to just listen because this isn't isolated. Breonna Taylor wasn't isolated. Um, Ahmaud Aubrey isn't, wasn't isolated. These are things that are like a compound fracture that have been crushing the soul and the spirit of black people for hundreds of years. And so we don't just go and say that's one person or for you to, you know, some people would say, well, no one would ever do that to Brian. You know, people aren't looking for your articulation. They're looking for your skin. They're looking for your face. We know that there are people that are in the state who are here who mean no good. We have people in our communities. It's not the people from our communities who are doing the looting and the burning. There are videos of young African-Americans saying, stop, don't. Now, maybe there were some who took advantage of the broken open spaces, but you have to see that this is a spiritual battle of epic proportions and that there's a reality of proximity that when you don't live in it day after day, when it's not your ancestral heritage, when you don't have to be the one, when you leave the Twin Cities to know where the places are, when I leave the boundaries of the Twin Cities, I know where the First Nations reservations are because I don't trust that if I get stopped that I will be treated safely, hmm. not only as a woman, but as a black woman. So when I get further north, I know where every Native American reservation is. Yep. I know where my friends are. So we think about the movie The Green Book. Some of us still live the movie The Green Book. Yeah. So our reality is, even if we're in great relationships, the reign of terror that we have had in this country for hundreds of years um, fractures the soul and the spirit in a way that just becomes unbearable. You've given your life to this. I've known you for a long time. You're passionate about it. You're a voice, um, a global voice, a national voice on this subject matter, and you have a rich ancestry as well. Yeah, absolutely. There'll be a picture that we'll put up of my, my great, right there in the middle is my great, great, is my great grandmother. Um, Jean Viev Massey, who was the daughter of an Irish slave owner and a slave. And uh, to her, on her side, with her hand on her shoulder, is my grandmother, Isabel, at the top, my uh, great aunt Louise, and then Camille, uh, the tiniest one on the side. Um, and I think about them, and I think about, uh, while they have these beautiful collars on, my great grandmother worked in the red light district of Minneapolis and took her daughters uh, to Manitoba, to Canada, to be raised because she did not trust that they would be safe. Um, and so our ancestry, while we are grateful to have those stories, we were also raised by those people who told us their stories and told us their stories. And so we have all been raised with stories of warning. We don't just have those pictures. We are trained if we get stopped. Mm -hmm. We can't just tell our sons. We've got to tell our daughters. If you get stopped, put your hands on the wheel. Make sure that you, you say, yes, sir. Make sure that your breathing is labored. You know, you, we, we have been taught and trained how to fear. 
because especially during the times that you were talking about with Dr. King, many of those people that were sworn to serve and protect were also those who were the greatest violators. They were the Klan. Yeah. They were those individuals who, by the dark of night, would do completely different things than they would do during the day. So we have been raised with a certain sense of knowing and a certain sense of fear and trepidation and a certain amount of catching one's breath yeah. that creates the, 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 um, pre con the, the conditions that people are talking about, hypertension, and some of those other things. It's not just because of the things we eat, it's because of the conditions in which we have lived for hundreds of years in this nation. Yeah, and we have been too silent, uh, Laurel, and I have too, even as the pastor of Westwood two years ago, I confessed that to our own church family. Um, that I will take this stand with you, that your voice is being heard. And I pray that through um, even the events, as tragic as they are today, that the voice does get heard and we do see a movement that um, takes us into a better way forward. And Brian, um, you're an educational consultant, and I think Laurel hit it spot on. This isn't an isolated deal. This right. speaks to the disparities that are far beyond law enforcement here. And as a consultant going into different school systems, you, you see those disparities. Speak to yep. what you see when you go from one school system to another across the country. A absolutely. And I think there's a, a direct correlation in the research and the the science, the medical science and the physiological science bears this out. You know, uh, when people um, have endured and have navigate, navigated uh, generational trauma, uh, you see those things um, occur. Um, and then when you juxtapose that trauma uh, with some of the historical um, failures of society, so I'm thinking of redlining yeah. Um, in North Minneapolis uh, and in um, spots like Edina and Bloomington, that's part of uh, the Twin Cities history. Um, those, um, those conditions have persisted over time. And so it's no wonder that we see uh, disparities in health and wealth, uh, income, um, and um, in, 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 in education particularly. So. Um, Generally, what we're seeing uh, across the land <clears throat> is that Hispanic students um, are lagging two grades behind their white peers. Black students are lagging two and a half years behind uh, their peers. When we look at uh, household income, we know that generally uh, um, black and Hispanic families um, are at 60 percent uh, of what white household incomes are, are garnering these days. 60% today, 2018, 2019 is the data showing. And in 1967, it was 55%. Mm. So we've turned, the nation has only turned the dial about 5% in 53 years. And so, um, you know, we have to be cognizant of the generational trauma, the disparities, um, and understand that uh, racial segregation um, combined with uh, those disparities in, in income, it's a perfect storm. And so it's no wonder uh, that uh, we have not successfully mitigated the education gap between students. We're doing uh, a little bit better. Some states are doing better than, than others. Um, here in Minnesota, we could be doing a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, in my work, you know, regionally and across the, the, the country, um, there is a, a movement afoot to be more intentional about the plight of black, Latino, and, 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 and poor kids. But um, COVID um, uh, yeah. shows the disparities, Shows the disparities, it? illuminates, yeah. and, and in fact exacerbates. So when LA Unified... Uh, um, launched their uh, distance learning program. Uh, LA Unified is a district of about 490, 495,000 students. Um, 55,000 students on the first during the first week didn't have access to technology or yeah. didn't show up. And so when you think about 55,000 people not having access to learning, to connection, to 
uh, relationships with peers and mentors and teachers, yeah. that's going to carry forward. Yeah. And so those, those are some of the disparities that are directly linked to this generational trauma. Yeah. That I was awakened to the pandemic reality a few weeks ago when Transform Minnesota asked for a special meeting with uh, Sankofa black pastors, white pastors who traveled to the civil rights journey together, and uh, they spoke about what they're experiencing with the pandemic, the things that you're speaking about. And for all of us, this has been hard, but I think I had this aha moment that what we're experiencing is doable hard. But what many of them are experiencing in the urban centers especially is destructive hard. Yes. And so we've tried to step into better understanding and learning and even action around those given steps. Just pick it up from there, Brian, because we are predominantly a white church. Yeah. And if you could give one word of advice to us in terms of how we could be better awakened, how we could better listen and learn through this season, mm -hmm. what would you give to us? Um, I think it would be the same word that I would give to um, people all over the, the world. And that would be um, pause. Um, it's, it's not coincidental in my mind, at least, or my heart, that um, George's wind, his breath, was taken from him. Um, the fire that we saw um, is emblematic of uh, destruction and rage and anger. Uh, wind and fire are prominent throughout the scripture. I think God has given us this moment to, to say, you all need to get this together. You all need to get this right. And so I think uh, all of us, but, but particularly uh, majority populations, need to pause and reflect. Uh, we need to understand that um, our mental models have origins in primitive societies where it was not intuitive to have conversations across difference. Um, now, uh, we live in multicultural, multilingual communities. We need each other. We need to be interdependent. Um, and we need to understand um, how we're showing up. And so I think that um, it's important for all of us, but perhaps maybe more so acutely uh, for, for white people, for majority people, is to self-interrogate, ask yourself questions. Um, how are you leaning in across difference? Yeah. Um, are you making an intentional effort to um, connect with people who are different, who think differently from you? And then af as you have those conversations, you have those connections, um, pause again. How are you feeling about that? Are there some rewards that are coming from those interactions and those engagements? If not, why not? Um, is it challenging for you? If so, why so? Um, but the time has come for us, and I think uh, we've seen this. We saw this last night. Uh, we've seen people from all walks of life helping to restore the damage mm -hmm. and the destruction yeah. in the Twin Cities. And I think we'll be a light, uh, yeah. the lighthouse for the rest of the country. But um, it, it, it is not um, uh, consonant or consistent with the gospel. The gospel is a gospel of equity and justice, no doubt about it. And so as believers, we have a, an obligation, we have a moral obligation to do the word and to represent the word and embody the word. And so that means uh, we, we can't remain cloistered in our narrow precepts yeah. uh, of our ideology. That's a good word. And I Agree. Some of the beautiful expressions of love that we saw yesterday, especially, I hope they can get magnified and captured and put on the nukes yes. and not just destruction yes. uh, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of it all around the Twin Cities. I appreciate the pause with a purpose to interrogate yourself, which is not easy to do, to ask those hard questions. Why do I believe what I believe? How did that get formed? It does take intentionality, and it's easier when we can be with people of color who help us go into that self-reflection place. So, Laurel, you said to me that 
Every day in your sphere of influence, people that you know who are white are asking you the question, what can I do, what can I do? They, they want something to do. And how are you responding to them? Well, in a similar fashion, the first thing I'm saying is, is yeah, do that self-interrogation. And, it's, and ask yourself, um, when you hear a racist comment or a joke, are you more apt to kind of laugh with it? Or are you more apt to say, that's not funny? There's nothing funny about that, even if it's your family member. Um, do you have a level of courage to face this? Um, do you write this off? This kind of thing we're talking about is um, social justice gospel. This is not social justice. This is my life. And you, you can't, I'm saying to you now, we can't be family if this doesn't matter to you. Good. We're not. We're, if, if my life, if his life is only contextually important when we're saying and talking about things that matter, we're not family. Because family wrestles with things in the hard and in the ugly. And um, we have to do more than this. I understand the realities. As I said to one people, either we're going to be a bridge or we're going to build a wall. It's easy to build a wall. It's easy to become self-protective. And I don't think any of us are saying, you know, um, oh, well, you know, let the chips fall where they may and let's just burn everything up. Listen, in the neighborhood I live in, the Target is closed, the Cub Foods is closed, the Whole Foods is closed, the Mississippi Market is closed, all of it is closed. So, and, and then not only were the freeways shut off, but the light rail is shut down, the buses are shut down. That means that people don't have access to food. What the media is not showing you are black folks and white folks and other folks working together, bringing diapers and food, men standing on corners, working with the police, protecting and surrounding the homes of people. I wish rather than critiquing what the governor isn't doing, or what the mayors aren't doing, and being armchair quarterbacks, we would all go buy something extra and give a little bit extra because people are hungry. Mothers don't have milk to feed their children. You've seen and I've seen young African-American men moving water and things, not just busting in buildings. It is not simply one ethnic group of people tearing things up. It is kids that look just like Westwood who are in there breaking things open. So this is a spiritual battle, as I said, of epic proportions. I understand what it is to be a bridge. Let me say this to you clearly. People who are bridges get walked on. People who are bridges get their underpinnings broken. But we can easily build a wall, and I could easily say, nope, I'm done, or I can continue to try to be like Jesus and allow myself to be broken because that's what it takes to get people to the other side. I want my Bethel kids to get to the other side. I want all of us to get to this. Every major movement, including the civil rights movement, had black folks and white folks in it. This is not a us versus them. This is not about shaming and blaming white folks. This is about calling the body of Christ to say, we need help. If the Imago Dei, if you dare believe that to be true, if you believe that the image of God is in me, then you must believe that it was in George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and all of the others that came before him and every other sacred body that has been broken. It doesn't mean they were perfect people, but we, we have got to be better and do different. You said something to me that were the very same words of Reverend Richard Coleman, who was with us a year ago when we launched our uh, racial justice and reconciliation ministry team. And uh, this was in the emergency meeting that was called this past Thursday that caused most of us as pastors to make our way down to the three, third precinct on Thursday afternoon. And he said, we need the voice of white pastors and leaders and people to speak out because otherwise we'll never get on the solution side of this. And you said the very same thing and just explain that a little bit more. It, it was when we think about the civil rights movement, right? If we didn't have the white media that finally saw the brutality and knew it wasn't an exaggeration, we would never have gotten the nation's attention. If we didn't have the videos, and I've heard people say, this is the problem with social media. Too many people are making a judgment. Let's just wait. If, if, you, if you dare watch that man beg for his breath with no remorse whatsoever on the face of that officer, and again, I will tell you, I know all five of the, the last police chiefs of the St. Paul Police Department. I love and know many officers. They are saying police chiefs from across the country are decrying that. 
Yep. Other police officers are saying, no, 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 we are trained differently than that. I know Matt Bostrom, I, who was the former Ramsey County Sheriff. I know good sheriffs. I know those, but I know there are great officers. I know there are great people. But when you are sworn to, to protect and to serve, you cannot step in somebody's neck. I don't care how big they are and allow their breath to leave them yeah. in that manner. It's just, it is a brutality that is scary. And it's not even the death. It's the, this vigilantism. It's the apartheid, show me your papers. Do you belong here? It's the man that was uptown Minneapolis that dared ask two African-American young men who owned a business, do you belong in here? And taking out his phone. This is not apartheid. You don't have the right to ask me if I belong here. You don't have that right. The woman that was in Central Park, a man watching birds and asked her to put her dog on the leash, and she threatened his life. A local newspaper that some of you read accused me of calling a student a Nazi that never even happened, but people believed it. Why? Because it's so easy to believe that the person that is brown is the villain. You have got to know the truth, and the truth is what sets us free. It's not our wealth. It's not where we live. It is the hard work of doing that work. And I've seen many evangelicals, thank God for Nick Hall, for Pulse Movement, for other pastors that I have seen, for Carolyn and Peter Haas, for hundreds of white pastors and others who have linked arms like yourself, who are down there bringing water, Jeff Hill in Serenity Village. We have seen that. Media outlets, please cover the whole story. Yeah. Please do us a favor and stop just covering the sensational things that are going to give you ratings. And please do your work to make sure that you are not inciting additional fear in the state of Minnesota. Please show the pastors who show up and put themselves in harm's way. Please do your jobs fully. Because if you don't, you're a part of the problem, media. You all are a part of the problem. And we need everybody to know it because we've seen it with our own eyes. People putting themselves in harm's way to protect children and women and others. There's a beautiful picture, and I'll end with this. There was another riot, and you've probably seen it, in, or another um, um, breakout in another city, and there is a picture of a police officer who got separated from his unit. Do you know that there, are, there is arm-in-arm arm African-American young people blocking and protecting this police officer from any harm? That is the heart of the urban core. That is the heart of people. Poverty and socioeconomics does not make you spiritually depraved. That's right. And we're not helpless. I mean, it's so great to hear your voices, to give perspective and dimension. Um, I'm going to invite Pastor uh, Ben Rosenbush and the worship team to come forward. And uh, we're going to have some time of prayer in a moment as well. But give some hope in terms of the reality beyond this given moment. Because it's the sustainable efforts mm -hmm. when the cameras are gone that are going to really make the difference. Because when we feel helpless, we become passive. And when we become passive, we don't want to do anything. But we can do something. The Church of Jesus Christ has a voice. We have this opportunity to connect condemn the violent abuse of power. We have the opportunity to call for justice for victims and their families. And we have the opportunity to combat attitudes and systems that perpetrate this racism. And this is a moment of time that can change history for the next decade and the next decade after that if we seize it with the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And as Westwood, we're seeking to do that as well, um, coming alongside of um, our own people to create this racial justice and reconciliation team. And Ben Rosenbush is the pastoral liaison to that team, and he's just going to share a little bit about what this team does and how you might want to engage further with it. Thanks, Joel. Our RJR team is just full of such great people, and it's been so rich to take in today, and I trust that that's been the same for you. Um, our mission in the RJR team is to pursue racial justice and reconciliation through the love of Christ. It's about being the love of Christ in this world, and this is a part of that. And we do that in three ways, and um, there's going to be an email that comes up on the screen, and... Uh, please just email us if you're interested in our events that we're doing and getting involved. We'll put you on the list. But this is how we go about pursuing that, is by awakening. We awaken to the reality that there is systemic racism in, in our country that we as followers of Christ need to contend against, and we need to awaken. And that's what we've done today by listening with Brian and Laurel. Please 
listen to this again, this conversation. Let that sink in. This is a part of our awakening. I've been speaking to white Christians in particular, myself. The second way we do this is by learning. We learn the critical histories of this racism, and we learn how that we can be involved as well to pursue God's kingdom on earth, which is a kingdom of justice. And I'm going to give you three uh, tools to learn this year, next steps for you if you want to learn more. The first is to check out this book if you're an adult, The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. It's such a great book that speaks about the history of systemic racism and how we can get involved in the church. And then I'm also a dad, and many parents are out there too, thinking, how can I raise my kids in a way that they know about this and that they can be leaders of the next generation? Here's a book for kids six and up. It's just simply a kid's book about racism. Check that one out. Um, there'll be resources to on, on the chat field online if you want to check that out and click on that. As well as if you're, you have a student at home, check out this book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. It's really helpful tools to raise your kids in this. So those are your next steps for learning. And also, the third step in our mission is engaging. Engaging in specific action. We want to move our bodies into what we believe. We want to put our faith in motion. And for those next steps, Pastor Brian Suter is going to give us some great action steps that you can get involved in this week. So stay tuned for that. Um, and as we close today, we want to pause, as Brian Fleming encouraged us to. We want to lament and pray. So I want to invite you into that as Pastor Joel leads us in a time of yeah. lament and prayer. We wanted to gain understanding. We wanted to give hope. And we certainly want to turn to God and Look for him to bring help and healing and to engage us further. So each of us are going to offer a prayer, Brian and Laurel and myself. And uh, at the conclusion of our prayer, we will say together, Lord, hear our prayer. And when we invite you to join us in saying, Lord, hear our prayer, and I invite you to just open your hands, if you're willing, as a posture of humility and receiving from God all that he wants to give us in this moment and in this time. And let's go before him in prayer. Thank you, Pastor. Lord, we pause in this moment in your presence, relying on your grace, relying on your mercy, relying on your wisdom, that each of us in our own way, in our own active, intentional way, would consider the conscious and subconscious ways that we either disrupt systemic racism or how we exacerbate it. Lord, we say together, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for the body of Christ entire on this Pentecost Sunday, the day that we commemorate when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and upon those who are believers and filled with them with the Holy Spirit and gave them courage and gave them power to be able to stand and to, ex uh, to continue to move forward the church. Lord, we pray for the church entire. We pray for the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We pray for the communities, the South Side, the North Side, St. Paul, Midway, and all of our communities that have been so broken by the looting and by the pain. But we also pray for the victims, and we pray for a generation of young people that are exhausted and depleted and are angry. Lord, we thank you for those who are standing in the midst of this. We know that buildings can be replaced. We know that we can raise money to help support others, but a life cannot be replaced. And so, Lord God, in memory of George Floyd and for all who have come before him, we pray together. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. So, Lord, we come. And we say it again and again in our own place of Westwood Community Church, our home. If we could only get the love thing right, there's no end to what we could be or do for your glory and for our neighbor's good. We just don't always get that love thing right. So we turn to you, the one who always gets it right. Help us to see people the way you see people. Not from the outside first, but the inside. To treat people the way we want to be treated, the golden rule, the very glue to our society and to love people the way you love us, and oh, how you love us. So continue to awaken us, increase our understanding of self and our own views. Give us an appetite to learn, to be educated, 
and move our hands and our feet toward action, that we would engage our body, mind, and soul to make a difference, that we would be and live more like Jesus, Son of God and Savior of our soul. We say together, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Jesus, we know that you're the God of peace and the God of justice. You're the God of love, and so we look to you. We raise all this in your holy name. We say together, Lord, hear our prayer.